Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is a blessing to be in your house and to see the sun rise each morning and to be see and to enjoy your wonderful creation. We pray that you there will be love and unity in our homes, in our church, our community, our state, our nation, and all over the world. As we continue our Christian journey, we ask that you be with us and guide us each step of the way. Help us to live our lives that others, people, will see that we are Christians. We pray for our nation, that our leaders will lead us in the right direction. There's so much toil and strife and everything in the world. Be in our midst as we continue this worship in song and message. Amen. Please stand as we sing our praise hymn number 227, Praise Him, Praise Him. Please stand. and greet your neighbor by passing the peace of Christ.
close Martha this morning. Good morning. Welcome. Wasn't that a pretty day yesterday? Pretty today. If you're visiting with us this morning, I hope someone has shaken your hand and given you a special word of welcome. We're glad to have you and hope you'll register with us in the little card there in front of you. By way of announcements, uh, they're in print in your bulletin. Next Sunday is Sock Sunday, and it is also a part of WMU Focus Week, which begins tomorrow, and the ladies will not be outdone by the Baptist men. There's going to be a breakfast next Sunday at 845, and everyone is invited. Come and bring a friend. I'm sure it'll be worth your time. Come hungry. There's a WMU leadership meeting for the Elkhorn Association on February the 9th, tomorrow at 6 o'clock. There's a scarf bombing going on in Winchester, and you see a long article there about it. It's kind of taken uh, a movement across the country, and Winchester is included, a unique, uh, creative way to provide uh, scarves and gloves and hats for those who need them in the cold. There'll be a wedding here on Saturday. Uh, our church secretary is getting married to Brian Nichols, and you are invited to a clock. Other announcements? Deacon's meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 and business meeting and potluck dinner on Wednesday. If there are no other announcements, may we continue in worship as we stand to sing hymn number 208, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. May we stand.
Shear, would you lead us in our offertory prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to thee this morning if we can be in thy house to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray, dear Lord, as we give our offering this morning, give it unto thee to do the work of the Lord here at this place. We pray for the message today. Pray for Brother John as he brings the message to us. And pray that thy will will be done in thine own way. In Jesus' name, amen. This past week we had a tragic accident again uh, related to one of our community, our church custodian Leonard Robinson's 17-year-old grandson Zach was in a car wreck and killed on Tuesday night in Georgia near Atlanta. We want to keep him in our prayers and that family. Frank Bennett is back in the hospital at Central Baptist uh, with health complications and uh, doing some better. Been there uh, several days and hopes to come home maybe tomorrow. And in nursing homes, Ruth Shelton, Donna Walden, and in retirement homes, Ms. Ella Saylor and Elizabeth Ann Spa. Uh, please help us to keep this list uh, updated. Today we turn to one of the most memorable and well-known stories, parables, in the life of Jesus found in that great 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 and following. And behold, a lawyer stood up in the midst to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus answered him, You have answered right. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. 
Which of these do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among robbers, Jesus said. And he responded, well, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. May God bless the reading of this great story in Holy Writ as we pray. In gathering today, Almighty God, whom through Jesus Christ we address as Father, we pray that our thoughts, our actions, the various elements of this worship service, this time together, would all be aware and focused upon your holy presence. That all that we do would be to glorify, to honor, to hear, to listen, to be aware of your presence, your teachings, your glory, your forgiveness, And in your teachings, may we discover where we fit today in this imperative from Jesus to go and do likewise. Speak through your holy word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Don't let the familiarity of this story obscure the profound turning points, hints, that the story has in it. Even at the very beginning, Jesus senses something going on with this lawyer that came to him, and Luke places it in this language, a lawyer stood up in the midst in order to put Jesus to the test. Luke could have written in order to ask a question or an observation, make an observation, but no, to put Jesus to the test, a word used for trial. Maybe that's a good word for lawyers, John. <laughs> put Jesus to the test. Somehow he, he came with, Luke tips us off early that he's got an ulterior motive. He's heading someplace. He's got a conclusion in mind or something he wants to expose to put him to the test. And he came with a question, a good religious question that would have been recognized as spiritual in origin. Surely, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I don't know what in his life made him feel like good things are those which you inherit <laughs> or not. But the way he phrased it, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, kind of savvy to the dynamics at work here, you can just kind of feel it, says, well, what does your Bible say? Jesus can ask questions too. <laughs> he answers with a question. He's a master of dialogue. Well, what does your Bible say? Well, that was the lawyer's chance to, to shine. And he began to quote scripture. He knew his Bible. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he tied in Leviticus 2, and your neighbor as yourself. I can imagine him standing there with his chest puffed out. He, he'd, done it, he'd said it right. And Jesus gave him credit. You have answered right. Do this, and you will have eternal life. Do you get the nuance there? You've answered right, but answering right and knowing the right answer and having the orthodox beliefs that you have is not what issues in eternal life. Jesus didn't say, because you know this, because you've answered right, you'll have eternal life, which is what you came seeking. No, he said, right answer. Now do this, do what you know, and you'll have eternal life. Now, that may be hard to swallow for Baptists, but every time I read Luke 10, it says that. It hadn't changed. It still says that. And the words in this Bible that I brought this morning are read. And we know what that means. The Bible says this, yes, and Jesus said this. The lawyer had somewhat embarrassed himself by asking a question to which he already knew the answer. And maybe it began to show. And so he needed to do what? He needed to justify himself a little bit. And so in order to justify himself, Luke writes, he said, okay, who is my neighbor? Now he's putting Jesus to the test. Who is my neighbor? That's all well and good. Love God with all that I got and my neighbor as myself. But somehow it depends on who is my neighbor. Of course, as a good Jew uh, and scribe, he knew the Old Testament teachings that your neighbors are Jews. Neighbors aren't Gentiles. Neighbors are Jews. And you need to love your neighbor. Stay away from Gentiles. Stay away from Samaritans particularly because they're half and half. They're, they're an impure race completely. 
So when he said he needed to justify himself, what was he justifying when he asked, okay, who is my neighbor? Could it be that he was trying to justify his prejudice? Seems to be heading that way. In order to justify his theory on who neighbors were and who neighbors were not, he asked, define neighbor, Jesus. Well, Jesus can play right along. I think I'll tell a story. <laughs> he answered with a story. Who's my neighbor? Okay. A man was going down to the, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Wait a minute. What, a man? Was he a Jewish man? Was he a Gentile man? Was he a Samaritan man? Was he a white man? Was he a black man? Was he a yellow man? Jesus doesn't say. He's just a man. He's just a human being going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers. And the characters of the story began to be put in front of us. There is, first of all, I suppose, uh, the lawyer. We've already talked about him. He is uh, politically correct religiously correct, educationally correct. He's right there in, in, in the middle of, of Judaism, of the organized religion and society of his day. He's par excellence. He's exhibit A of success. He knows how to write it. He knows how to say it. He knows how to ask it. He can quote scripture. Then there are the robbers. They are those who take what they want from other people. It doesn't belong to them. And if they have to beat them up and strip them, and they did in this passage, they stripped him, he's naked, and they beat him, and they left him half dead, the robbers. Then there's the priest and the Levite, who are pretty much represented in the same way. Uh, they're in and around the temple. They're in and around the a church house, they, maybe somebody said it's the preacher and the minister of music, the Levitical folks. They passed by on the other side, went on to church. Then there's the Samaritan. We talked a bit about the Samaritan and what the Samaritan represented. When they built roads in Israel, they built a road around Samaria so that they wouldn't have to go through there and be defiled by Samaritans. You know, they're the descendants of the half-breeds that stayed around and intermarried with the Canaanites after the exile uh, hundreds of years earlier, and they just kind of defile the country. And then there was this victim. This victim, he doesn't have a name. Names aren't given in this story. They're not necessary in parables, generally. Is he a Jew? Probably. But we're not told. We might surmise that he's a Jew, but we don't know that. And when you're stripped and laid bare, you know, there's not a whole lot of clothing and marks of identification that, that make you known as this or that kind of person. <coughs> Emerging then from the story is this question of neighbor. Who's neighbor? And there are two or three groups here. The first of all is this, this guy that's in the ditch that represents something about human need in the passage. It's a story about ministry to human need, and it's obvious in the passage that that guy in the ditch needed help, right? We don't know how he got there except that we're told that he's beat up and robbed, but if you came along, you, you didn't know the robbers, you didn't see it happen, but you can see for sure that he's in a helpless situation, um, like the car that's wrecked on the side of the road and you're the first one that arrives and maybe the wheels are still spinning and somebody's waving for help or maybe there's no movement in the car at all but no one else is there and you know somebody's got to help out here because whoever's in this ditch is not going to be able to grab his bootstraps and get out. These are the needy and they need us. They need a helping hand. They need somebody to help. Maybe you've been there yourself before. Who are they? They're the lonely who, 
who are desperate for some kind of friendship, fellowship. Uh, they are the addicts who have gotten addicted to some kind of substance, alcohol or drugs, and they just can't whip, whip it on their own. They've tried, and they stumble over and over again, and they've got to find somebody to help them. They need us, or they need someone in their own group who has recovered and can teach them how, who's been down that road before themselves. The needy, they're everywhere. They are the stranded who have had a car wreck or beaten. They are the homeless who don't have any shelter, and it's five degrees outside. That's why we had the Super Bowl party at Calvary last, last uh, Sunday. That's why we have Sock Sunday uh, tomorrow or next Sunday. That's why we, that's why we do Feed My Sheep. Um, there are people who are homeless or hungry or helpless or lost, and they need somebody to help them. Well, God helps those who help themselves. Yes, but God also helps those who help others. And God helps the helpless, who are the helpless. In recent years, Mark Wills sang a, sto a song, a country song. Here's another one by. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Remember that song, any of you? I'm a little boy with glasses, the one they call the geek. A little girl who never smiles because I've got braces on my teeth. And I know how it feels to cry myself to sleep. I'm that kid on every playground who's always chosen last. A single teenage mother trying to overcome my past. You don't have to be my friend, but is it too much to ask? Don't laugh at me. Don't call me names. Don't get your pleasure from my pain. In God's eyes, we're all the same. Someday, we'll all have perfect wings. Don't laugh at me. I'm the cripple on the corner. You've passed me on the street. And I wouldn't be out there begging if I had enough to eat. And don't think that I don't notice that our eyes never meet. I lost my wife and little boy when someone crossed that yellow line. The day we laid them in the ground is the day I lost my mind. And right now, I'm down to holding this little cardboard sign. So don't laugh at me. Don't call me names. Don't get your pleasure from my pain. In God's eyes, we're all the same. Someday we'll all have perfect wings. Don't laugh at me. I'm fat, I'm thin, I'm short, I'm tall, I'm deaf, I'm blind. Hey, aren't we all? Don't laugh at me. Don't call me names. Don't get your pleasure from my pain. The needy are those who are dazed and confused, and no matter how much we or they might think they should be able to grab their own bootstraps. They don't have any boots, and the world's full of them, whatever your politics are or religion. James wrote about it in the book of James. He'd heard this teaching from Jesus, no doubt, his brother, and he wrote, What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but has not works? Can his faith save him? If a brother is ill-clad and in lack of daily food and one of you says to him, go in peace, good luck, be warmed and filled without giving him the things needed for the body, what does it profit for faith without works is dead and apparently does not result in salvation. You have answered right, Jesus said. Do these things and you will live eternally. The needy need us. Now less clear from this passage, but profoundly true, is the fact that we need them too. We need the needy. Well, what do we need the needy for? Well, in this way. You know the story by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol? We all know that story been remade so many times, animated and the like. Remember old Scrooge? He counted his money one penny at a time, and he held on to it with a tight fist. And little tiny Tim, remember the little crippled boy in the story? Scrooge was unable to be a human being until he encountered tiny Tim. 
and that needy family, and he needed them to become a human being. He had buttons for eyes up until that time, but Scrooge needed Tiny Tim to make a better person out of him. The needy bring out the best in us. How does it go? We never stand taller than when we stoop to help someone else who's beaten down by whatever. We need the needy to make us human. The hungry feed my sheep. They need us. They need these sandwiches for whatever reasons. But we need them too so that our religious pilgrimage can be authentic. Nada needs us. Come with me to Nada and see those 15 barefooted kids in the winter. <laughs> That's only a slight exaggeration, Juanita, right? But we need them too. We need them too. That's our chance to minister. That's our chance to put into practice what we deep down know. Go and do likewise, you see. There's a profound teaching in Matthew 25 about where Jesus is in this world. It's a parable of judgment where Jesus in that parable separates the sheep from the goats. And these that went to heaven they said, why? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was hungry and you gave me a sack with a sandwich in it. When did we do that to you? Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. How does the saying go? Be, beware of angels unawares. Do you want a closer walk with Christ? Well, sure I do. You want eternal life? Of course we do. Then go and do likewise. Extend the hand. Do like the good Samaritan. We get closer to Jesus. We need the needy, you see. That we not become insulated in our cocoon of security. I was asked by the director of the WMU of the Elkhorn Baptist Association to write a devotional for their yearbook. <laughs> it's due the 12th, isn't it, Francis? I've got it here. And the director happens to be a member of our church, Francis Curtis. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the whole devotional, but I'm going to read one paragraph. It was, I was assigned the, the watchword for the year, the scripture for the year for the WMU for the offering. Uh, Eliza brought us, no, not Eliza brought us. Julia Woodward offering, is this, Matthew chapter 8, where Jesus began to teach his disciples he must be rejected by the elders and killed and crucified and so on. And Peter said, oh, no, we don't let that happen. We don't want that kind of Messiah. And the passage says, and Jesus called to him the multitude and along with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his, my, his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his life? And in this devotional the paragraph I wrote, the disciples were slow to realize and accept this kind of king and this kind of kingdom, which is not of this world. And so are we today, especially as we realize that if the master traveled the way of the cross, so must we who would follow him. In the kingdom of this world, we seek what we think is best for ourselves. We worship at the idol of our own self-interest. In the kingdom of God, we surrender our self-centeredness into service to God and others who are beaten by the side of the road. In our own self-interest, we hit back in self-protection, but as disciples of Jesus, we turn the other cheek. In religious self-interest, we seek to get by with the minimum expected of us. In discipleship, we go the second mile. In religious self-interest, we might forgive seven times. As disciples of Jesus, 
we forgive 70 times 7. In pious self-interest, we might share our coat. As disciples of Jesus, we share our cloak as well. As good religious practitioners on the way to church like the priest and the Levite, we might go regularly. But as disciples, we don't pass by on the other side on the way, but stop and minister to those who are beaten by the side of the road. To understand this principle, we have to be willing to deny ourselves, to take risks, to get involved. For as long as self-interest drives us to gain the whole world, we're actually losing the very life that God wants for us, that he offered the lawyer if he would go and do likewise, and that is life eternal. We need the needy so that we don't become more like the robbers who go through life seeking primarily personal gain, even if we have to take it from someone else, because their ethic is what's yours is mine and I'm going to take it. We need the needy so that we do not become like the priest and the Levite, who though they are very religious, their ethic is what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. We need the needy that we might become like the Samaritan, who first of all stopped. <laughs> That's enough challenge in itself, isn't it, as we go about our busy paths in life, to, to just stop, to just stop and go over, turn aside from our plan, and look into this situation of need and share it. And his ethic was, what's mine is God's. And I'm going to share it. Not just a little bit. Yeah, here's two denarii. Put him on his own horse or camel, his own beast. Took him to the hotel, to the inn. This man couldn't be out in the elements in the condition he was in. He needed a hospital. It wasn't a hospital, but there was an inn. Put him in an inn told the innkeeper, here's two denarii to pay the bill. I've got business down the road. Keep a tab of whatever you have to spend to help him get well, and I'm going to come back through and I'll pay the bill in full. That's not token giving. He paid the bill. Go and do likewise. What must I do? What must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Can you phrase it any other way? What does your Bible say? Love God and love neighbor. That's right. Now you go do that and you'll have eternal life. I can't explain all the theological overtones of this, but this comes right from the tongue of Jesus. There's one more character along the road I want you to think about. I want you to close your eyes and think about it. In your imagination, you're going down the road of life. Think about some of the tough times you've had. Go down that road and look over across the road in a ditch. There is a, foreign, a fallen traveler. There's a fallen traveler. Go over and look at him. Perhaps he looks familiar because you've seen his face in the mirror somehow ambushed by your sins or crushed by personal, family, professional crisis, the loss of a loved one, whatever the reason, you realize at that moment, I am the needy. I need help. I need a savior. Then in your imagination, I would remind you that when you open your eyes, there is someone kneeling over you with scars on his brow and wounds in his hands and tears in his eyes, who says to you, I understand, for I have been there. I am the wounded healer. Get up. Come with me. I will wipe away your tears. I will bind your wounds. I will do whatever it takes because I paid the bill at Calvary. Go 
and do likewise. May we pray. Our Father, may the piercing truth, joy, and hope of this profound story live again as only your word can in and through us. May we be willing indeed to turn our eyes on Jesus Christ, to see him as the eternal great physician, the heavenly good Samaritan who has come to restore all of us, put us back on our feet and send us to go and do likewise. May it be so in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of invitation today is number 320. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. As we sing this hymn, if you have a decision to make that you would share with these good people regarding your relationship with God, your church membership, whatever, you come as we stand and sing. standing we have three that have four that have come forward this morning elizabeth john comes to celebrate her birthday and recommitting her faith in christ publicly and her birthday is february the 3rd 2000 happy birthday a little bit late but happy birthday i've watched you grow up mary beth johnson comes to celebrate her birthday and reaffirm her faith publicly now, her birthday was on Friday, and she was born in 1923. Happy birthday. Any bor anybody born as early as 1923 here today? I sort of doubt it. When we get down that road that far, I believe we get to be willing to admit it, don't we? Although my mother never did. She was born in 09. Happy birthday, Mary Beth. Thank you. And we're praying for your great nephew, you. Austin. He's doing better. Good. He's doing better. Wonderful. Diane and Courtney Hatton were married 56 years ago. What date were you married? What? What was the date? Today. Today. Today is your 56th anniversary. Wonderful. Happy anniversary. Right here. Dalton Leith? Right. Yeah. 
Very good. Happy anniversary. Good to be in God's house together. Uh, let's bow together for our closing prayer, and I'll ask Judy Hicks if you would please to lead us in our benediction.